Hello, good morning. Good morning, Hope, Hope everyone is doing well. Yes, yes sir. 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 Okay. Do we have any questions or any um, uh, contributions on what the presentations that we've done so far? And some people also owe me uh, 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 presentations, adding something to their presentations, and I haven't received it. Please put it on the page so that everybody can have access to it. I hope this morning we are all going to be attentive. We are going to all going to keep quiet for the smooth running of the presentations this morning. Uh, please, which group are we on now? Which groups are going to present today, please? Group 13. So group 13, 14, and 15, if uh, time will allow us. Can can we start? Can we set the ball rolling? Right. I, so, I, I, we are about one sixty two. Please, what is one sixty two? Please. Sister, I said they are now joining the class. So, so we right. should we should it's we should time. wait for them. No, sister, you should continue. It is time. Oh, yeah. It's time. It's 7 o'clock and they are not joining us. They have to. Okay. You let's, it's now, uh, it's now 7 6. Let's give them about 10 minutes and see. Can we give them about 10 minutes? Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. So let's give them ten minutes. When when is seven sixteen? Group thirteen. You start. You can put your slides there. You can share your slides as we wait for them. Okay, so uh, group 13, you can start, please. Good morning. My name is Josephine Mustafa Osman, presenting on behalf of group 13 on the topic hair lip and cleft palates. Hair lip, hair lip or cleft palates is a congenital deformity resulting from the failure of the fusion of the median nasal and maxillary process during organogenesis. So with cleft lip, the upper, with the hair lip, the mouth, the, um, the organs, the, the muscles there or the tissues, they fail to fuse together. So it leaves a space as shown in the pictures A and as shown in the pictures B and C. And then with cleft, there's a defect where there is the fusion in the palate resulting from a lack of fusion. And with cleft lip two, the same happens. There is no unity in the skins or around the palate. As shown in the pictures D, E, and F. The incidence of cleft palate is approximately one in 1,000 1, live births worldwide. However, the incidence is greatly affected by ethnic background, geographical origin, and the social 
economic level. The degrees of cleft palates are mild notching of the lip. It can be like there's a small dip in the upper lip, or there's the severe. The severe one is the enlargement of the opening of the lip up to the base of the nose. So that one, the line will be from the mouth to, to, uh, to the inside of the nose. And the types are unilateral complete, unilateral complete, and then bilateral complete. Unilateral complete is the notch just at the tip of the mouth and it will be open. And then we have the uni uh, another unilateral com complete, which is the, the opening with the lip up to he hello, the hello, hello. Uh -huh. uh -huh. The first one is unilateral incomplete. Yes, please. Uh huh. <laughs> so the, make make that statement again. The unilateral incomplete. Oh, wow. the which is at the lip, just at the lip. And then the second one is the uni the unilateral complete. That one is from the the notch is from the lip to the base of the nose. That is the second picture. And then the bilateral complete is on both sides of the lip to the base of the nose. Who is, who is, who is presenting? Just for me. Josephine. Yes, please. Okay. Oh, please, you can continue. Okay, sister. So we have the types and the degrees of cleft palates. So in the figure, first figure is the normal palates, but nothing wrong with it. And then when we come to the Second figure that is the left unilateral cleft palate, cleft left and palate. That's one as you can see, the, there is no fusion in the upper floor of the palate and the the lip. And then when you come to the third picture, that way you can see that the palate is wide open, and the notch on the lip is on both sides, giving making a space in between them. A cleft palate can either be by can either be bilateral, that is on only one side involved, or bilateral, that is both sides. It can also be complete, it involves both the primary and the secondary palate, or an incomplete, involves the secondary palate only. The differences are, the characteristics is the location, with a cleft palate, with a cleft lip, sorry, with the cleft lip, it happens on the upper lip. And then it's also on one or both sides. And it, the severity is that it varies. The effect is that the appearance or the speech or feeding difficulty that it can cause. And then the sector repair timing is typically a few months old. But with the cleft palate, with the location is the root of the mouth, that is the palate. The side, side affected are the soft palate, the hard palate, or both. And the severity also varies. The effects is the eating, speech difficulties, the potential for ear infection that can occur. And the surgical repair timing is usually in the first few years of life. The causes, the definite causes of cleft lip and cleft palate is not discussed. Researchers believe that most cases of cleft lip and cleft palate are caused by an interaction of genetic and environmental factors. Cleft lip and cleft palate occur when tissue in the baby's face and the mouth do not fuse properly. Normally, the tissues that make up the the cleft lip and the palate fuse together in the second and third months of pregnancy. But in babies with cleft lip and palate, the fusion never takes place or occur only parts we leaving 
an opening, which is called a cleft. There is factors of, there is factors. Genet, one of the risk factors are genetics or family history. So a patient with a family history of cleft lip or palate has a higher risk of having a baby with um, a cleft. And also the environment in which the person is exposed to neutral. So if the person is exposed to harmful substances during pregnancy, such as smoking, alcohol, substance abuse, or certain medication that are not prescribed by the um, medical person or medical professional, it can lead to a cleft happening. And then we have maternal factors such as diabetes and obesity. It's one of the factors that, that can lead to a baby being exposed or having cleft lip. And then lack of folic acid intake before and during pregnancy. We know that prenatal care is very important. It helps with uh, uh, preventing of certain urinary tube defects and also certain deformities. So if a person doesn't take prenatal vitamins, there is a risk of the baby developing a cleft lip. The diagnosis, it can be through prenatal ultrasound. So the prenatal ultrasound may reveal the condition or physical examination conducted after birth and let you know that the baby has left or left palate. With the treatment, the treatment surgery is done to close the palate in the lip and the, to close the lip and the palate. So several hours or weeks after birth, depending on the severity of the condition. Just like we said with the cleft lip, it can be done maybe weeks after birth, but with the palate, it may take some years before surgery is done. And that speech therapy will help with communication and speech because it will affect the speech of the child, of the neonates in future. Or, and in the units, it will cause feeding difficulties. So, and then orthodontic care for dental realignment. So that is in the future, but in the, it has to be fixed now so that it prevents such cases when the unit is born. In nutrition, you administer tube feeding if nipple feeding is to be delayed. So at times when the baby has the bilateral cleft lip and palate, it is quite difficult for them to feed. So tube feeding is rather better because it prevents them, it allows them to get the nutrition that they need. Then if sucking is ineffective due to inability to create a vacuum, alternate Try alternate oral feeding method. So the baby can't feed due to the bilateral or the unilateral complete. We'll give, we, it's better if you give cup and spoon feeding because the vacuum that the, makes the baby not able to suck due to the opening. So if the, the, if the baby had no cleft lip or palate, there will be the suctioning. That allows the baby to feed, but since it's there, it doesn't create that vacuum. So the baby will not be able to feed. So cup and spoon is better. Using a squeezable bottle for applying rhythmic pressure during unit normal sucking and swallowing. And also a syringe or dropper with a rubber extension long enough to extend back into the mouth and feed slowly. So if there is also a syringe that is long enough and it's, it's very soft, that can go into the baby's mouth to the back of the mouth to help in feeding because we know that cleft palate extends, can extend as far back into the baby's mouth. So if 
that is not done. Any feeding or any uh, milk or breast milk that is given will come out through the nose and will cause problems. Then feed the baby in an upright position or sitting position to decrease possibility of fluid being aspirated or returned through the nose or back of the auditory canal. Feeding is often easier if nipple is angled to the side of the mouth, sorry, to the side of the mouth, away from the cleft, so that baby's tongue can press the nipple against the upper gum. So with this, you're saying that the cleft is always at the media side of the mouth. So when you turn the baby to the side, you angle the uh, nipple to the side, it's, the baby will uh, be able to suck on the, at the other side of the mouth, so the corner of the mouth. So the baby can use the gum to suction the breast milk out. And then you feed slowly. You feed the baby slowly, um, slowly, 18 to 30 minutes. So um, the possible duration when you are feeding the baby, so you are careful to prevent aspiration and also um, I'm going into the baby's nose and the auditory canal, that is the, yes. The complications are the children with cleft palates, the neonates with cleft palates, with or without the sorry, the neonates with cleft lip, with or without cleft palates, face a variety of challenges depending on the type of the cleft. So we have difficulty in feeding. One of the most important after birth is feeding. While most babies with cleft lip can breastfeed, a cleft palate may units may have difficulty in sucking. So there's the development of ear infections and hearing loss. So units with cleft palate may are especially at risk of developing middle ear fluid or hearing loss. And then in the near future, we have them developing speech difficulties and then challenges in coping with the medical condition when they go facing med uh, social, emotional, and behavioral problems due to their appearance. So when we want in preventing of clefts, in prevention of clefts, uh, parents of cleft, uh, cleft affected units, Worry that some issues for future pregnancies. So, in order to prevent such, we encourage mothers to do genetic counseling so that they will know if they are their family or they are at risk of having cleft palates, cleft lip or palates, and also prenatal vitamins. We should ensure we should educate the and enhance the use of prenatal vitamins that it helps to prevent these um, abnormalities. And then the use of alcohol or tobacco use. Very yeah. <laughs> use of alcohol or tobacco use during pregnancy will increase the risk of the baby having such effects. So education is important. Please, we are done. I'm done. Okay. Group 13, uh, thank you so much. Please, do we, please, have, do any we have any questions or contributions for them? <clears throat> I think um she lost some of the slides and I can show my own too. So the person who can show it, to show it so that we can present. The management, the immediate subsequent management and nursing management. Yes. Yes, I'm okay. I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing the immediate nursing management. When when I click on mine, it's it shows but it's more small. Then, 
Then uh, the nursing yeah. management. So I was coming to ask, please, <laughs> you, 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 you are not done with your slides. The immediate nursing management, you, you didn't come, and uh, uh, nursing management, you didn't come. So if you can please go back. Any member of the group? Josephine. Yeah. So, so please be there. You, you know, some of your some of your presentations didn't come. Okay. Like uh, like the immediate nursing management. Yes, sister. So if you can give us that, or okay. any member of the group. So with the immediate nursing management, when the baby is born with a cleft palate or a lip or cleft lip, you immediately the care the immediate care is very important to ensure that the well being and the supports to support their feeding and breathing. So immediately we clear the airway. Please, the person who has stopped sharing the screen, I'm reading from it so. If you could share. Please, can you bring the screen back? Can you bring the screen back? But uh, Josephine, don't you have it yourself? No, sis, I don't have that particular one. Then I think go to the page. They put it on the page. Sister, please, can we read without the slides? Um, without the slides showing. Yes, because you are wasting time. Okay, sister. So with the uh -huh. immediate as I was continuing the airway, you make sure that the airway is clear by suctioning the fluid gently for um for any mucus or fluid that may be in the mouth or the nose so that you ensure that the airway is clear and unobstructed. Dry and stimulate and access baby's general condition with Abgascope. And you initiate skin-to-skin -skin contact to keep the baby warm and to promote bonding. Please, next slide. So, and assist the mother to initiate feeding within 30 minutes if possible. And all other care, including eye care, vitamin K injection, and identification of the baby should be done. With the subsequent nursing management, you perform head to toe examination from the baby's general condition or the severity of the condition and inform the medical officer of the baby's condition so that the baby is to the nickel for further management. Also, we prevent infection by practicing and teaching mothers and parents good hand washing. Also, visitors should be limited. Baby's temperature, the baby's vital signs 
should be closely monitored and reported. So anything above 37.0 is a very, um, <clears throat> dangerous uh, vital. Any temperature that is above uh, 37 shows that there might be signs of infection for the baby. And all equipment used for the baby, including the feeding bottles, the cup, and the spoon should be all sterilized to prevent introducing infection to this baby or this unit. And you observe the unit for signs of infection, including the drainage from the clefts. So we want to see if there's any, don't make sure that there's no drainage or there's coming from the space between the nose and the lip or any leftover the breast milk that we get that there's no, not, nothing stuck in between the that it can harbor infection. So, huh? we self prescribe antibiotics and we observe for adverse reactions. And we promote oral hygiene by gently cleaning the baby or the unit with a soft cloth to keep the area after feeding and to prevent infection. We provide emotional support to the parents by reassuring and providing them with the needed information or available resources to enable them to care for the donors when they are um, when they are in the facility and when they go home. And professionals we should encourage them or introduce them to professionals who specialize in cleft palates and lip or the surgeries that are available um, to that's available to be done for the units. Please, the next slide. So, please, sister, we are, we are done with the nutrition. So, with the pre-operative care, prepare patients, in, uh, the parents emotionally for the uh, um, surgery at hand. To make sure that they sign the consent form. We practice the feeding measures that will be used after the surgery. That is the cup and spoon, the cup and the syringe, of the, or the side of the spoon method. And then we ensure that the unit is well dehydrated. Sorry, the unit is well hydrated, and we serve with IV fluids. And then we demonstrate and practice mouth irrigation, as it will be done after the cleft palate surgery. Then we place the neonate in the prone position or the sideline uh, uh, side position to familiarize the neonate with the positions. So after surgery, the baby must, the neonate be fed by breastfeeding or cup and spoon and teach mother the feeding technique. And we give small amounts of water after each feed to cleanse the incision and to prevent infection. Due to their being now is closed. So the baby is learning how to suck and how to feed and all those so we make sure that for any wound we will because the wound will not be bandaged, the wound is um open. So we make sure that we clean the incision, make sure that there are no um, breast milk um, getting into the wound that will cause or that will harbor infection. And then we serve and monitor prescribed IV fluids and medications. So we want to prevent the baby from being overhydrated. So we make sure that we monitor the, flu uh, monitor the fluid intake. And we say the medications that we are given, and um, we make sure that it is served. It is served at the right time, so that the baby can get the best amount of care, the right amount of care. For um, we, we restrain and cover the neonate's hand to prevent baby from putting the hand in the mouth. So as for like any neonate, when something is wearing them, they try to 
know the reason why they move the kick. So we want to prevent the unit from maybe putting the hand around the area or putting the hand in the mouth that can cause harm or bruising or can remove the stitching. So we restrain the units so that they don't they don't cause any harm or put their hand in their mouth. And we observe and monitor baby closely for infection and any change in condition. So after surgery, make sure that vital signs checking are done at the appropriate time so that we know there's any change in the baby. Observation of the baby to see if the wound, there's any bleeding coming from it or um, the baby's general condition is okay. Please, the next slide. Please, this has been, I've done this already. Okay. Okay, group, group 13, thank you very much. Now they've completed. Why are you moving? Why are you removing the, the, the slide? Okay, now they've finished the, 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 uh, their presentations. Please, do we have any comments? Hello. Any Hello. questions? Any contribution? Yes, Abigail, your hand is up. Yes, sister. Sister, good morning. And um, please, I would like to know when the surgery is done for. Abigail, the baby. your hand is up. Yes, sister. Sister, Abigail, good morning. Good morning. Hello, good morning. sister. Uh, yes. Please, I want to know when the surgery is done for the babies with um clear palate and uh, clear lip. Thank you. Okay. So, group, group, group 13, they want to know when the treatment is done. Yes, group 13, they want to know when surgery is done. Group 13. Um, um, please, sister, during the presentation, we said that with the cleft lip, surgery can be done in some months after the baby is born. But the, for the pilot, the baby has to turn a year before the surgery can be done. Thank you. OK. so. So, uh, like, just as she has said, if it's only the lip, then some weeks, some uh, some months after, after the baby is born, surgery can be done. But if it involves the pilot, some some uh, some children even go up to five years. Some they do it stage by stage. So from some uh, 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 weeks. Two years. Please, Alice, are you okay with that? Yes, sister. Thank you, sister. Okay. okay. Any other any other question, contribution, or comment? Hello, sister. Yes, ma'am. Please, can we know the exact <clears throat> month? The exact month. When they do their lips, exact month. You know, we, uh, I can't. We can't tell the exact month. That's why I'm saying that if it is only the uh, the lip, that one they can even do it some some weeks, two, three, four weeks going. But if it involves the cleft palate, you know, sometimes the the cleft palate, it, it's they, they do it stage by stage. I know, I know of a, a doctor whose baby had cleft lip and palate. And they were doing it in stages. Even when the girl was four years, they did some. So I, I don't think they have the exact... It depends on the severity of the condition. Please, please, are you following us? Yes, yeah, sister. 
Uh huh. Nana Kosia, Bedua, your hand is up. Yes, yeah, sister, please. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to talk about the um duration. Okay. I read in a surgery book that most of these conditions, um, you don't take the baby for the surgery advice. You wait after six months. That's when they mostly do the surgeries or the corrections. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, sister. Yes. Please, I have a question. Yes. During their presentation, they made mention of temperature of 37.0 to be the normal one. But to my knowledge, should be monitored for signs of infection. Pardon me, I... I... So are we going to use the normal body temperature for babies so they are as for them they have to be monitored differently as temperature of 37.0 if anything exists that the baby is ill. Thank you. I uh, hello, I didn't get your question well. I said during their presentation, they made they made mention of temperature of thirty seven point zero be the normal temperature for the new units. And if anything exists, that the baby should be monitored for infection. But to my knowledge, a normal body temperature of a new unit is thirty six point five to thirty seven point four, and they are saying it's thirty seven point zero. And I want clarification. That's to me, it's at seven point four, and they are saying if anything exists at seven point zero, the person, the baby should be monitored for signs of infection. Um, group thirteen. Group thirteen. Hello, sister. Please. We are not saying that the normal temperature is 37.0. We know that these babies are at a higher risk of getting infections. So we are saying that when the baby gets a temperature of 37.0, that's when we should start, like we should be concerned. But we are not saying that the normal is 37.0. Because they are at a higher risk of getting infection. When we check the temperature and it's from 37, then we should be very concerned. That's what we are saying. But please, I'm also saying that seven point zero is normal temperature for them. That that's my concern. Like that is a zero is a normal normal temperature for you or the slide that we presented because we said um when. When you get to know that the baby's temperature is getting to Hello. Hello. Hello, sister. So I think I think that uh, they should they should say above 37. If the temperature is above 37, then I, I think uh, 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 we should we should look into that. Yes, please. We said monitor babies by size closely and report them above thirty-seven point zero degrees. So the, the the person the person is also arguing that thirty-seven is normal. That is the person's argument. That thirty-seven. What is the normal temperature for, for a new unit? Thirty-seven point five to thirty-seven point four. So, so it, then, my dear, let's okay. let's cut this uh, Second World War. Let's make it above thirty-seven point four. 
so that the the sister please it's, it's above that that's in uh, in our presentation it's above 37 we didn't say 37 it's above so you, let's let's add the point four to it let's add the point four to it because we know that the normal temperature is 37.4 and so anything above 37.4 okay okay Okay, sister. Yes, sister. Okay, sister. Okay. Stella, Stella, your hand is up. Good morning. Good morning. Stella. According to the app presentation, the predisposing factors. They said mothers with diabetes, their babies are predisposed to cleft phallus, and I don't understand if they can do more like Go group 13. Group 13. <laughs> yes, sister. They are not seeing a question that's why would uh, 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 somebody with diabetes <laughs> diabetes can <laughs> get uh, 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 for diabetic uh, uh, mothers, they are prone to uh, first and uh, bed defects. A lot of them are prone to bed defects. So that that's the more reason why we are saying that uh, first and for cleft parents and hand parents is a predisposing factor. When you take hundred percent, let's say you can get one or two bed defects on the end. So it can be a uh, first and cleft parents or hand parents or other bed defects. Okay. Thank you. Hello, sister. Yes. Hello. Yes, please continue. I'm going to add up to what my sister said. Um, with the diabetic mothers, we know that during the developmental stage, that is when the fetus is developing, um, the diabetes, the increase in the diabetes will affect blood vessel formation in the developing fetus. And we know that proper blood flow is essential for normal organ and facial structure development. So when there is an increase in the blood sugar levels to affect the formation, that's also the reason why we said that. Okay. Okay. Any any other? Any other? I I want us somebody somebody ask, somebody asked about the the time that they do uh, uh, they repair the cleft. I just I checked and as I was saying with the with the cleft lip, if it is only the the uh, uh, the. The lateral, the lateral incomplete. That's one. It can be done weeks after that. But if it is the uh, the lateral complete, then it's five months to six months. If it involves the palate, it's ten to twelve months. Then, if it is such that the, there is, it has affected the baby's speech, then the surgery will be done three to five years. Then, if it affected the 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 uh, the mandible or the lower lip, it is done seven seven to ten years. So it's 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 the surgery is done according to the severity of the condition. Please, are you with me? Yes, yes sister. Okay. 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 So there is another hand up, Anastasia Kwang. Yes, sister. Thank you so much, sister. Please, uh, I know you said you should drop the second world war, but. 
I also wanted to say something uh, in support of what my sisters were saying. We know that uh, in labor, I want to use labor to explain what they were saying. In labor, you know, when someone is in for, uh, for CM dilated, that is the person is in the active stage. But if after four hours, the person is still in 4 CM, we take an action. Though she's still having the active stage, we take an action. So to compare to what they were saying, we know the yeah. normal temperature of a, patient, uh, of a baby or a neonate is 36.5 to uh, 39.4. But they have explained that hey. because these babies are nice susceptible one. to infection, okay, they are susceptible to infection. So when you see that the temperature has risen above the 39, you need to take an action. Meaning no, they no, are no, at, no, uh, no, at no, the no, chance of no, getting no. infection. Anas, yes, it's about yes, it's yes, it's, it's not. Yeah, that was what they said. No, I said 37. No, you no, said also facilitated. Is it? Ah, okay, then I'm yeah. sorry. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. they are telling us that when we see that temperature, not that it is not normal, it is normal, but it is something telling you that take a like big critical about them because they are approaching or the, the probability of them exceeding the normal will be high. I think that is what my sisters who facilitate are trying to talk about. They are not saying the 37 is not normal. It is normal. But they are saying someone with this condition is at high risk of getting infection. So when you see it, take care about it. I think that's what they are trying to tell us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As I said, we should end this temperature matter. If we are if we are saying that abnormal temperature is above 37.4. And so if, if you take that is why we continuously take the baby's temperature or do the baby's temperature so early. So that when you do and you know that you are going above 37.4, then you know that there is an action to be taken. But when you take continuously take and it's 37, 37, 37, then it means that it is normal. But when you say, I am saying, I am saying that, they are saying that above 37. And we all know that 37.4. So I, I wanted them to say above 37.4. So that if you continuously take the temperature and it is above 37.4, then you know that there is something wrong. So you start taking your precautions before it escalates. But if you take and it is 37, 37, 37, then it means that the baby is, is, is the temperature is normal. So please, let's end the temperature something. Let's make it above 37.4. And that is the, the normal that they've given to us. Thank you very much. Please, I think uh, group one, you, uh, group 13, you've done very well. I wanted to see the, the, the members here. Yes. Yes. So I'm doing it at random. I'm calling the names at random. Sylvia, oh. appear. Yes. Are you in class? Sylvia, <laughs> so, are you in class? Neighbor <laughs> from Paul Manso. Rebecca Al Hassan. <laughs> Now that I'm a fool, I say class. I'm in class. Okay. So, class. My phone was disturbing. Joyce Lino Fori. Joyce Lino Fori. Lydia Enin Kufo. Um, come back. Lydia Enin Kufo. Yes, sister. Dorcas, okay. Dorcas, everyone at the property. Yes, sister. Arabic men standazi. Yes, sister. Lydia Blay. Yes, sister. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yes, sister. Francis Asha Bando. Yes, sister. Okay, that is okay. 
Now let's go to group 14. Hello, group sister. 14. Yeah. Hello, sister. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mention my name. My name is Mary Aka. I said I was doing random. Random. Random picking. We are all in class, sister. Hey, sister, so, no mute else. yourself. Okay, group thirteen. Uh, group 14. Sister, please, we are about to share our screen. Group 14. Okay. Awesome. I'm not certain. Current here. We got an Mute yourself. Sisters, please, good morning. Please, I'm Grace Addison, representing on behalf of Group 14. Gastrochichis. They said gastrochichis, that is stomach clear. It's a congenital bed defect. It's a congenital bed defect. Put an opening in the Turn to the right of the umbilical cord. This opening allows the intestine to protrude outside the abdomen. So with this, uh, when the intestine is outside the baby's abdomen, we term it as gastrochitis. Please, the next slide, please. Sister, please, the next slide. Please, we are waiting for the next slide. Daddy. You join me on my teacher and everyone names. So now you know me and go on. Everyone names now, Mrs. I didn't hear my name. I said no. It's all over. We need to move it. Oh, Rule Fourteen. Oh, oh. Mister, please. That's what I agree. Visible outside the baby's body. And there may be damage to the intestines due to exposure to amniotic fluid. 
Gastrochiches is typically not covered by protective sac, unlike the omphalocele. Diagnosis. Prenatal ultrasound can detect gastrochiches after birth. Gastrochiches after birth, it is usually diagnosed based on the visible protrusion of the intestine. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. sister. Uh -huh. Please, it's gastrochiches. Gastrochiches. Kisses. Yes, yes. Thank you, sister. Hey. Yeah, yes, you can continue. Nursing management. Nursing care involves protecting the exposed intestine from infection and damage, often using a sterile plastic wrap. Surgical repair is required shortly after birth. Postoperatively, nursing care involves monitoring for complications, including infect infection and bowel dysfunction. So please, this is the, the picture for gastrochesis. Causes of gastrochesis and exomphalos. The main cause of the above condition is unknown, but there are some predisposing factors. We have maternal polyhydraminos, maternal illness, maternal infection, Drug so dependency and alcohol and maternal age. My mistake is bad. Exomphalos and omphalos cell. Who is doing that? Abba. Omphalos cell is a congenital birth defect where a baby's abdominal organs, such as the liver or intestine, protrude through the umbilical cord base and are covered by a thin sac. Clinical manifestation. The abdominal organs are enclosed within a sac, which is typically visible at birth. The size of the omphalous cell can vary. Diagnosis. Prenatal ultrasound is often used to diagnose the omphalo cell. After birth, the sac containing the abdominal organs is visible. Nursing management. Nursing care focuses on protecting the sac and its content, contents from infection and injury. Surgical repair is usually performed and post-operative care involves monitoring for complication. Prevention. Omphalocele is a congenital condition and it's not preventable, but maintaining a healthy lifestyle during pregnancy is advised. Complications. Complications can include infection, difficulties with organ function, and other associated birth defects. So this is a picture of the omphalocele. As you can see with the gastrochesis, the, the organs are exposed, but with the omphalocell, the organs are protected in the membrane. So the differences, differences between exomphalos and gastrochesis. The gastrochesis location is right side and the exomphalos, the location is center. With gastrochesis, content not covered by membrane and presence of peritoneum amniotic membrane in the exomphalos. Then there's embryopathy. Then the, gas, the gastrochesis, there is the content, that is the intestines, bladder, and gonad. And the exomphalos, the umbilical cord inserted in the caudal area of the hernia sac. And the gastrochesis is really associated with congenital anomalies. With the exomphalos, there is fetopathy and the content intestines, spleen. So immediate management and care of gastrochesis and exomphalos. Immediate management is aimed at preventing the organs from drying and infection. Cover the baby from legs to thorax with silicone plastic bag to provide warmth. 
Inform doctor immediately. If a district, transfer and accompany to the hospital. Fluid and electrolyte loss says replacement is essential. Surgery is performed to correct the defect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Group 14. Please, do we have any questions, comments, additions for them? Okay. In summary. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, they, they said the management that the management uh, is surgical. But uh, we have had cases with exam follow cell, uh, cell, which is it was even big. But we dress for like we were dressing <laughs> daily dressing. It will reduce by itself till everything is gone. It depends on how big it is and the, how the, the, the pediatric surgeon will decide what to do with it. Uh, but mostly you dress it and it will go. There is a full cell. It will reduce and everything will go back by itself. Just that you have to be doing daily dressing. You make sure in fact, uh, you cover it with wet surgical gauze. Sterile goes. Then the uh, what do you call it? The gastrochesis. That one you put you, you have to put the uh, organs, the intestines in a plastic bag and hang it. So everything will be going daily, small, small back into the intestine. When everything is gone, then they will now close it. They will do the surgical procedure and close it. So with the as a follow cell and the gastrochesis, the management is different. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ophelia Morrison. Sister. Yes, Sister, your hand is up. Sister, please, they mentioned that some of the uh, predisposing factors are uh, polyhydraminous of the mother. I want to know how that can bring about the gastrochesis. Thank you. Group 13, uh, 14. I, I, I was also wondering, into, I'm even checking from the net how uh, polyhydraminous can cause gastrochesis and uh, exanthalus. Please, can you throw more light on that for us? Okay, sister, please. Uh, polyhydraminous usually okay. If the baby does not swallow or absorb the amniotic, uh, amniotic fluid in normal amounts. So with the it can be an indication for gastrointestinal order, uh, disorders. Not, uh, uh, I think it was a mistake. It's a mistake on our part. Rather, it could be used to diagnose the the the, the gastrointestinal disorders. No, it's not. A... Yeah, like uh, I said, it seems to be a, an error on our part. Oh, no. okay. Okay, then if it is an error, you have to. Remove it from yes, it. We will Dr. do it, sister. Uh huh. Doctor Sasamwa. Hello. Good morning. Please, I want Good to morning. find out if um um examplos and omphalocell if is the same thing. Examplos and omphalocell. Thank you. Okay. And please, it's not the same thing. They might be classified under the gastro intestinal disorders, but with the uh, gastro uh, cases, uh, did I pronounce it right? Yeah, like we said, one is enclosed and one is like exposed. The gastro no, I'm asking, please, sorry, I'm asking about examples and um, omphalocell, examples uh, yes, and yeah, omphalocell. It's just another name for the omphalocell. Thank you. Any other? Please, any other? Um, doc, Docas, your hand is still up or?
Okay. So let me also add small to whatever that uh, they said. Uh, 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 somebody said the onphalosa um, and the gastrochesis. We don't do surgery, but we just dress it and it goes back to its original place. Um, you know, when you look at when you look at their pictures, can you please bring the gastrochesis? The picture. Yes. With this, if you don't do uh if you, yes, we have to put it in a plastic silicone bag and you hang it. But this thing, if you don't do surgery, this would, uh, 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 it would, it will get infected, and it will become gangrenous, and the baby can die. So can die. Do, as soon as possible, surgery is done. With with Ghana here with our dressing, daily dressings, daily dressing. <laughs> How 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 uh, best can we keep this from getting infected? So as as for this, as for the gastro keys, surgery is done as soon as possible. With the onphalosa or the examphalos, please let's go to bring the picture on. <laughs> On the uh, yes, with this, you know, as for this, we can be dressing it because this one is being covered with a uh, uh, a thin membrane. So getting this getting infected has a slim chance. But even with this one too, for how long will we continue? to uh, 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 dressing it, dressing it, dressing it till everything goes back into its right place. So this one too, surgery is also done. But as she rightly said, it depends on the severity of this. If it is as big as this, you can't keep on dressing daily till it goes back. So that is the little that I can I can add to it. With the example loss, it depends on the size and the severity of it. But with the gastrochesis, where all the intestines, sometimes even the the the, the gonads and the bladder are out, you cannot keep dressing it. It needs surgery. Please, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, please. Yes, Yes, sister. Yes. yes. So you know, every has every hospital has its own protocol, but there are certain cases that are very, very uh, is is emergency, and you cannot keep on dressing, dressing. If you keep on dressing, 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 you put the baby's life at risk. The intestines can get gangrenous. The baby can get systemic infections, and the baby can die. So that is it. Uh, please, Nina Robson, your hand is up. Hello, sister. Yes, Nina. Sister, please, I want to talk about the polyhydraminos. Yes. Sister, please, I, I read that uh, excessive amounts of amniotic fluid it, it put pressure on the developing fetus and including the abdominal walls. So this pressure, it weakens the abdominal muscles, making it more prone to defect. And also, the amniotic fluid, it compresses the developing intestines, causing them to herniate through the weakened abdominal wall. So I think it's part of it. As they said, it was oh, a okay. mistake. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, still, I'm still reading on it. So maybe next week, God willing, when we come, we would have a, a full answers to that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Um, Stella, Stella, Sam, your hand is up. 
Stella Sam, your hand is up. Hello. Okay. Yes. Hello. Uh -huh. yes. About what my sister said, the maternal polyhydraminos. Uh, it's in your notes. The handout that you gave us is in it. Oh, okay. 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 Uh, that, uh, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Usla, Usla Chinebua, your hand is up. Yes, sister. Thank you, sister. Please, I want to know, um, can can it be detected through ultrasound scan before the baby is born? And if, if so, what is the best mode of delivery for the baby? Uh, babies with gastroschisis uh, and uh, exophallus, if it's detected through antenatal, what is the best mode of delivery? Thank you. Okay, you let me let me let me come in here. Yes, you know this one is conged congenital defect. So, uh, 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 when the fetus is developing, that this also comes about. And so when you do ultrasound, you can detect that the baby is having these conditions. But for, for delivery, if a baby is having this condition, I don't think it will have any effect on spontaneous vaginal delivery. I don't, I don't think so. The, the person can have a spontaneous vaginal delivery all right. But it is when the baby comes that taking care of this condition will be the, the paramount thing. But with the delivery, I don't think it can have any serious effect with spontaneous delivery. Oh, uh, Usla, okay, you think? No, no, sister, I don't know. I, I just want clarification. I just don't know. Otherwise. Okay. Uh, Abigail, I said your hand is up. Yes, sister. Sister, please, um, I've delivered some before. It was through vaginal delivery, but um, during um, V, I felt the intestines outside. So I thought it was a service which has um, become edematous until the baby was delivered. That we got to know that this, um, it was the intestine, but um, nothing happened to the baby, but we referred the baby to um, Techiman and later they referred her to Konfanochi, but the baby died um, within three days. Was it exophallus or gastrochesis? Please, it was um, gastrochesis. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so may uh, okay. So that is what I'm saying. That if if we know we know from a scan and the gynecologist deem it good for the mother to be delivered through cesarean session, that one is fine. But I don't think it has anything to do with uh, uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery, as this, uh, as somebody has just said. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are now on group fifteen. Group fifteen. Oh, please. Are there any other questions? <laughs> Please, are there any other questions? No, okay, sister. then group 15. Thank you very much, group 14. Group 15. Oh, group 13, roll call. Group 13, roll call. Francis Kakesin. Francis Kakesin. Sister, please, I'm here. Christina Kafi Doga. Sister, please, I'm here. Mabel Abing. Sister, please, I'm here. I will what's my answer? Yes, sister. 
Um, Linda Odu. Linda Odu. Okay. Gertrude Arba Aqua. Gertrude Arba Aqua. Gertrude. Gertrude is not in class. Sandra Abanyaku. Sandra Abanyaku. Yes, sister. Um, Beatrice Quasin. Beatrice Quasin. Yes, sister. Regina Kwabinan. Yes, sister. Shelly Atubida. Yes, sister. Deborah Ajay Apia. Yes, sister. Justina Elop. Jack Basu. Yes. Yes, sister. Okay, so tell Gertrude that she wasn't in class. So minus 20. Okay, group 50 members, you can continue. Sister, hello, sister. Yes. Sister, group 13. We are Please. part of one day here, our name, so. Yes, it's a random sample random. that I did. Sister, okay. this is group 14, though. We group are group 14. Hello, ah, sister. Okay, okay, your group 14. Okay. Hello, sister. Yes. Sister, please, this is Marietta. I'm in group 13. I didn't hear my name. Ah, you just came and I mentioned your name and didn't keep quiet. You were saying it that me joining you and electronic for me, into no, I made you absent. Oh, sister, no, sister, <laughs> sister, please, now my network was poor. Now my, my father was helping me too. What? And then sure. I was sending it in the group that. Uh, my network is very poor, so I was. I I know one one year dinner won't yet, Jim. Some joining Yana, a lecture on the board. So I've marked you at this group 15. Can we continue? Sorry, I was in class. Stop, keep quiet. We're talking about 14 or 15. Please, which group is supposed to present? Please, which group is supposed to present? This is group 15. Okay, so we are waiting. Sister, please, good morning. Hello, sister. Yes. But the network took me off, so I couldn't respond. Group 14. Please, group 15, we are waiting for you. Group 15, we are waiting for you.
before okay hello sister good morning please i'm part of 15 i think we have a problem of sharing the slide i don't know if i can present without the slide so that later i'll send it to the group put it, put it in the put it in the page somebody will share it for you i'm bound like i can't share it i want to present but i can't share the screen are you the only person in the group no please then let right. other group members do it. Yeah. Put it in the group. Can any of you share the slide so that I can present? I can do the presentation. Please stop messy is sharing the screen. Mommy, we can off. Yes, idea. I'll come in this day. Why office? I don't care. Ah, why? Hey, hey, hey. Yes. Good morning, sisters. Once again, I'm Rita Isin from Amesa, presenting on behalf of Group 15. Please, our topic is on tennis syndrome. And the definition is tennis syndrome is a genetic disorder caused by partial or complete missing of the X chromosome in females. It is female only genetic disorder that affects about one in every 2,000 baby girls. So we have types of tennis syndrome or categories. So the first one we'll talk about is monosomy. This type means each cell has only one X chromosome instead of two chromosomes. That's two X chromosomes. The person has only one X chromosome. Please, Maria, we are making noise. What is that? This error occurs in the father's sperm or the mother's egg. This is facilitating. Hello. are diagnosed with this type of monosomy. That's the, the this type of tennis syndrome, the monosomy. Then we have the mosaic or mosaicism tennis syndrome. That's the second category we'll talk about. Hello, sister. This type means. I want talking. Hello. Hello. Uh -huh. Hello. Can I know your name? Please, can I know your name? Sister, please. Sister, please. I'm Rita Asin Chroma Mensa. Okay, hold on for me, okay? Because I don't want people to distract okay, your participation. I want to mute all of us. Okay. And I'll ask you for mute, okay? Okay, sister. Your, your name again. Your name again, please. Star, please, I'm Rita. It's in from Amensa. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You can unmute us, uh, Sister AC. Hello, sisters. Please, let's get to the diagnosis of tennis syndrome. There are two basic types of tests available to detect tennis syndrome during pregnancy. The first one is screening. A screening test can tell a woman and her health care provider whether a pregnancy has a higher or lower chance of tennis syndrome. Example, ultrasound during pregnancy can also determine the possibility of tennis syndrome in a pregnancy. Then we get blood sample to measure the amount of various substances in the mother's blood. Then we have a diagnostic test. This test can detect whether or not a baby will have tennis syndrome and it includes a chronic villus sampling this is a form of prenatal diagnosis done to determine the chromosoma or genetic disorder in the fetus it entails sampling of chronic villus that's a placental tissue a, placent a particular placental tissue and testing it for chromosomal abnormality then we have amniocentesis this is the medical procedure done between the 15th and 20th week of gestation. The amniotic fluid is analyzed via 
a method such as karyotyping and DNA analysis technology for genetic abnormality. Please, can you go on with my slide for me? Okay, so we have a percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. This can also be called, uh, that's what I frequently uh, uh, previously explained. And this one can be called chordosynthesis or fetal blood sampling. And with this fetal blood sampling, it's taken directly from the umbilical cord. So we come to the signs and symptoms before birth. So prenatally, tennis syndrome may be suspected on screening and ultrasound. Then prenatal ultrasound of a baby with tennis syndrome may show large fluid collection on the back of the neck or other abnormal fluid collection, that's edema. Then we have heart abnormalities and abnormal kidneys at birth or during infancy, the signs and symptoms. Signs of tennis syndrome at birth or during infancy may include wide or web-like neck, low set ears, broad chest with widely spaced nipple, high narrow roof of the mouth, that's palate. So this baby is at a higher risk of getting a cleft palate. Um, that turns outward at the elbow. Then a finger and toenail that are narrow and tense upward, resigning small lower jaw. Then short fingers and toes, slightly small than average height at birth. In childhood, teens or adulthood, the most common signs in almost all girls, teenagers and young women with tennis syndromes are, they have a short stature. Then ovarian insufficiency due to ovarian failure, slow growth, failure to begin sexual changes expected during puberty, sexual development stalls during teenage years, early end to menstrual cycle due to pregnancy, inability to conceive a child without fertility treatment. Please kindly continue with my slide for me. So we have some pictures, some pictures here for you. you see a the short stature and all those things. Then we, let's go to the complications. Tennis syndrome can affect proper development of several body systems, but vary greatly among individuals with the syndrome syndromes. Complications that can occur may also include heart problems. Many infants with tennis syndrome are born with heart defect or even slight abnormality in heart structure. That increases the risk of serious complication. We have high blood pressure, hearing loss. It's also common in these children. Then we have vision problems. And it's, it has a risk of, they have a risk of weak muscles and eye control of eye movement, henceforth, causing that vision problem. Then we have kidney problems, autoimmune disorders. Tennis syndrome can increase the risk of underactive thyroid, thyroid autoimmune disorders. So we have hypothyroidism here. Then learning disability. Girls and women with tennis syndrome have high risk of learning disability. Then there's infertility with people with tennis syndrome. Please kindly continue with my slide. So you have management of tennis syndrome. That's the immediate management when the baby is born. This baby has most of the, the body systems not functioning properly, talking of the kidneys, the liver, uh, the hearts, and all those things. So immediately the baby is born. These babies, their growth hormone is insufficient. So we have to give them, we have to subsidize their growth hormone by giving them artificial injections. And the treatment starts as early as five years of their child's life with low doses and increased doses around the ages of 12 to 15. Otherwise, their growth will be stagnated. Please, let's continue. Now, 
We also have estrogen therapy that can promote breast and uterus development. When we talked about the delaying in the, the maturity at puberty, this all this all bears down to the estrogen therapy, uh, uh, the uh, production of estrogen in their body. So we have to subsidize their hormones. I, as I previously said, that we give them estrogen. And during childhood, they have middle ear infections. So we have to be treated quickly. Then their blood pressure is to be checked regularly and treated if necessary. They are, and then we have the thyroid gland too. Their thyroid function test can be used to assess how well the thyroid gland is working. As girls with tennis syndrome have a slightly increased risk of having an active thyroid. Sister, please continue with my slides for me. So please, we also have the glucose level need to be checked for screening to rule out the diabetes. Then bone mineral density. Women with tennis syndrome have an increased risk of developing brittle bone, that's osteoporosis. So a scan has to be done to assess if the need be, then they're treated accordingly. Then the progesterone therapy, since it's also a hormone that can decline, it also has to be supplemented. So a replacement therapy will be done. Then we have a psychological therapy. Since they belittle themselves in the society, they have to, they have, their minds have to be prepared that this condition exists and all those things so that they also not feel they are minors in the society. Please continue with my slides for me. Okay, so please, here ends our presentation on tennis syndrome. Thank you very much for your patience whilst we were delaying. Thank you. Uh, hello, group 15. Oh. Hello, group 15 yes, members. Sister. Yes, yes, sister. Yes, sister. Okay. In the first place, thank you for uh, 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 doing this. It, it looks like you, 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 15, you haven't slept from all that I've been saying. I told you that we are doing it. And so everything that you present should be it. Then you said management of tennis symptoms with immediate management. So I took the immediate management. We are going to talk about uh, uh, all the principles that we, we use. As you just said, growth hormone and all those things. A baby, a neonate, how are we going to give the baby uh, growth hormone? Uh, hello, sister. Yes. Please, the, uh, the management that we did for the tennis syndrome, I think the immediate and the subsequent uh, work, they were joined together. Because I heard one of the colleagues presenting was confirming about the scan, scanning the baby vital organs. I heard it. Such as the heart, the kidneys, and the thyroid, and also providing neonatal intensive care unit support for the babies that are born with tennis syndrome. And also, they are they also give them the growth hormone so that it can help increase their size and then the bone growth. I also, I also heard mention about uh, vitamin D, about baby calcium. Yes, osteoporosis and then also fractures. And I also also consult with the genetic counselor and pediatric endocrine neurologist to also discuss the long-term treatment and then management of tennis syndrome. That is for the immediate, for the baby. And then the subsequent ones. 
regular checkups and then also the growth hormone therapy is also continuing and then estrogen replacement therapy is also part and then cardiac and renal screening which can also affect the kidneys they are also done I think my colleague mentioned them, but I think we joined them together. We didn't look, separate the immediate from the subsequent care. Look, it's at the immediate care. When the baby is born, we, we all know essential newborn care. When the baby is born, to the baby. Yes. What I want. Then, if after your immediate care, your routine care, then the subsequent care, if ultrasound uh, 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 will be done, if this will be done, if this will be done. But immediately the baby is on the second newborn care. What are you going to do for this baby? That is what I want. Okay, sister. Add yes. it. Sister, please will add it. Yeah. I'll, I'll be waiting for the addition. But before they, they add it, please, do we have any questions for them? Or any contributions? Any questions or contributions for them? Do we have any questions or contributions for them? Yes. Somebody send this up, Ophelia Morrison. <laughs> Ophelia Morrison. Sister, sister, please. I, I had um signs and symptoms prenatal something, so I'm confused. I don't know. Prenatal care or and I know prenatal care is before pregnancy. So we are doing units. That's where my condition came in. I want to clarify. Thank you. So, signs and symptoms. They say before bed. Tender syndrome may be suspected prenatally based on screening and ultrasound. So how does that make it signs and symptoms? Just Abigail, Afre, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, hello, sister. Yeah. Yes. And um, please, my question is um from the uh, routine management. Um, I had um, blood pressure is checked regularly and treated if necessary. Is it for the unit or when they are um, adults that they check the BP regular? Group group 15, the question is to you. That is That was why I was telling them that. Or uh, I was asking them for the immediate management. Look, we are working. We are working with babies within twenty-eight days of life, and so what I always say is that when you are doing anything, consider these uh, these people twenty-eight days of life. Then, when you finish, you can bring about prognosis that oh, in the in the course of their life, this is what they can get, and this is what we we, we can do for them. But if straight away you go to 12 to 15 years, we are doing neonates, we are not doing pediatric nursing. I know you. if you do pediatric nursing, all these things will be done in pediatric nursing. But we are doing neonates and high-risk neonates, high-risk neonates. So the blood pressure, she is asking, is it within the 28 days that you will do the you'll be checking the BP or when when and how will you do this? Sister, please yes. it's it's on that it's unfortunate our presentation has been this way. Sorry to say formally we pre prepared on Down syndrome. And unfortunately for us, a group presenter written, we have to 
go to the Turner syndrome, which, which is the second one. So we couldn't really go through so it so been... well, but we have to present. We are very sorry that... for that. And we will work on it, sister. Since we will work on last... it and then. Since last week. So that one, you don't have any excuse. But I'm telling the whole group that when we are doing, uh, we are going to do our presentations, we should just, we shouldn't just copy it and present. We have, uh, uh, we are doing unit. And unit is 28 days of life. So everything that you do, it should be within the 28 days of life. Of course, when you can come to prognosis, with the prognosis, it will be outcome. So that one can be outcome of a baby with tennis syndrome. When the baby is old, this and this and this and this is what the baby will get. And this and this and this is what we, are, we can do for the baby. Then we know that you know what you are doing. But if you go and bring all these things, it's just like you copied everything from the net and you are bringing it to us. Yes, of course, even those of us who teach, when we are teaching, we, we, we solicit for information from everywhere. We read from everywhere, then we choose those that are appropriate. So please, when you are coming this from the rest of the presentations, I wouldn't take this at all. Sit down, read, and pick the ones that are appropriate. And that shows that you are doing the work. And when you do it that way, anywhere that you are called to present or anywhere that you are called to give anything, since you sat down and you did it, it will be fresh in your mind and you always remember it and do it. So group 15, this one, the rest of the groups that are left, I wouldn't take this from you. Okay. So we won't talk again. Next week, you are you will be the first person to present. You will present it again next week, God willing. It's almost six minutes to time. So I want us to end here and God willing, next week we'll meet. So thank you very much for... Okay, no, 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 no. We have to do roll call. And mind you, I said it is random. Random. So, Messi Mensa. Messi Mensa. Sister, please. Uh, they are all muted. So, if they could raise their hands, then you oh, can okay. from there. Okay. But they've not raised their hands. Messi Mensa, let me yeah. see your hand. Okay, Elani Abua. Elani Abua. Okay. Uh, Victoria okay. Joyce Amwa. Victoria Joyce Amwa. Okay. Angelina Cheba for. Okay. Pepe Chua Amankwano. Okay, Grace Gansa. Emilia Akes. Mata, Mata Okai. Mata is not in class. Okay. Amdia Al Hassan. Okay, Anna Inkum. Anna Inkum. Okay, okay. So it's okay. Thank you very much for coming. God be with you. Next week, God will in group 15. You are going to present it again. Thank you very much and enjoy your weekend. Thank you, sister. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.